from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Special thanks to some of my patrons always. Freddie, Linda, Janice, Hammer, Katerina, Robert, Florence, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, two Emmas, Gabrielle, Emily, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, Judy, and John. As always, thank you so, so much. Since I got an overwhelming, yes, please give us more science. We can sprinkle these types of podcasts in from time to time if you'd like. So I'm going to swing for the fences, as they say, and begin with three different topics around serial killers and other violent offenders. Genetics, environment, and lastly, how our parents were raised as a factor which is an offshoot of the environment. So first, let's talk about genetics. As we know, genetics play a very big role in determining not only our physical selves, but our mental as well. The National Institute of Mental Health, or NIH, states that mental illnesses are, quote, common, serious brain disorders that affect our thinking, motivation, emotion, and social interactions. Because the illnesses are particularly difficult to model in animals, most research on the causes and treatments of them has occurred in clinical populations. Such studies will advance our knowledge of brain function by yielding increasing detail on what goes awry in illnesses. Building on these accomplishments, the search for disease vulnerability genes is likely to yield the most important tools yet in our ongoing attempts to understand the brain of mental illness. End quote. So the first step is identifying genes that potentially play a role in these complex illnesses or perhaps the genes involved in the propensity toward violence and understanding how genes affect an individual. Each of us carry between 80 and 100,000 genes and these enable every human characteristic. The issue is that the genetics of vulnerability to mental disorders is, in every case, very complex. Now, scientists have long recognized that many psychological disorders tend to run in families, which highly suggests genetics play a very big role. Some of these disorders include autism spectrum disorder. And side note, I'm actually neurodiverse, which is why I have to write all of this out and read it to you because I just can't do these podcasts any other way. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, bipolar disorder, major depression, and schizophrenia. There are hundreds of different types. So far, we know that no one specific psychiatric or mental disorder has a full 100% genetic basis or heritability, and many environmental factors may strongly influence the likelihood of developing a particular disorder or not but we're gonna touch on that a bit later. However, the disorders I mentioned, autism spectrum, ADHD, bipolar, major depression, and schizophrenia seem to have between a 70 to 80% inheritability. So let me give you a visual, right? As parents have children, each parent brings with them, let's say their own dice. Each time they have a child, they sort of re-roll their dice. Both parents bring with them their set of genetics or their die, and as they roll, different combinations come up. When it comes to mental disorders, we know many of them share common genetic risk factors. The genetic variation associated with schizophrenia, for example, overlaps with both depression and bipolar disorder. So if one of your parents suffers with schizophrenia, 
You may not necessarily develop the symptoms for that, but some of the shared genetic coding could cause you to experience, say, depression. And if you have a parent with depression, you are twice as likely to experience depression yourself. With a bipolar parent, you go up to four times more likely to be at risk. And with schizophrenia, well, that jumps up to eight times more likely. But don't despair. The overall risk still remains pretty low. So when it comes to serial killers, murderers, and so on, I love to cite the work of Dr. James Fallon, who is an American neuroscientist. He is the professor of psychiatry and human behavior of anatomy and neurobiology at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. Now guys, I'm going to do my best to not nerd crush too hard on him, but this man and his work is absolutely mind blowing to me. While doing his work, he discovered that he has the neurological and genetic factors of psychopathy. He calls himself a, quote, pro-social psychopath, though he fully recognizes that having a positive childhood and life experiences negates any potential violence-related brain and genetic patterns. He has books. He's written books. Go read his books. I will leave a link to some of his stuff in the notes below. So Dr. Fallon's presentation during his TED talk is what I have discussed with you in the past or on Instagram many times. The link is in the notes. He spoke about how he had analyzed over 70 brain scans of psychopathic killers, some famous ones I might add, which are the types of people that we typically talk about on my podcast. He was not told who the scans belonged to, so it was a blind study, okay? Each one of them had damage to their orbital cortex, which is in the very front part of your brain behind your eyes. It's also called the orbitofrontal cortex. This part of the brain is involved with cognitive processes of decision making. This and other close regions are essential with regards to rational thought, reasoning, and the full expression of your personality. It also plays a big role in impulse control and response inhibition. Damage to this area can cause personality changes, decreased impulse control, display inappropriate behavior, sometimes aggressive behavior, decreased appropriate emotional responses, and seem blind to consequences, and so on. And I really don't want to just repeat everything the good doctor said during his talk, but the takeaway is that there also exists a major violence gene called the MAOA gene. There is a variant of this specific gene that exists in the human population. This means that perhaps one of you listening is carrying that very gene. Now, this gene only exists on the X chromosome and is only inherited from your mother. Now, if you're a girl, you get two X's, one from your mother and one from your father. If you are a boy, you just get the one from your mother. So just absorb that for a moment. If your mother has that MAOA variant of the violence gene on her X chromosome, then with girls, you have the other X from the father to help kind of dilute it, if you will, that gene. But with boys, That isn't the case, and that is why we see the vast majority of very dangerous, violent criminals are in fact male. And then Dr. Fallon also states that too much serotonin while the fetus is developing contributes to this because when the fetus is exposed to high levels of serotonin, the baby's brain becomes much less sensitive to it. And, you know, of course we know that there are environmental And, you know, of course we know that there are environmental factors and other things that contribute to the outcome of a dangerous killer. But for this particular gene to be sort of switched on, as you will, other factors come into play. Not negative factors that the general population has experienced during childhood that most people experience. We're talking very serious issues. And this leads us to the second factor parental treatment, and environmental factors. Now, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, most violent behavior is learned behavior. 
Now listen to that again. Most violent behavior is learned behavior. Early exposure to violence in the family may involve witnessing either violence or physical abuse. Research suggests that this type of exposure to violence during one's childhood increases the risk of violent behavior during adolescence by as much as 40%. The absence of effective social bonds and controls, together with a failure of parents to teach conventional norms and values, can put their children at risk for future violent behavior. Then we also have the environment outside of the home, including the type of neighborhood and whether or not there is gang activity, illegal markets, including drugs, and so on. As we know, many children exposed to violence in the home are also victims of physical abuse themselves and are at serious risk for long-term physical and mental health problems. Children who witness violence between parents may also be at greater risk of being violent in their future relationships. A lot of the future behavior of the child depends on when the abuse is witnessed or experienced at what age and to what level of severity. These children often start out feeling fearful and anxious, always seem to be on guard and wondering when the next outburst will happen. Mothers or caregivers who do not spend time bonding with their infant puts those children at risk for attachment disorders. Preschool aged children who witness domestic violence may display behavioral regression like wetting the bed, beginning to suck their thumb again, and increased emotional distress with crying and whining. They may have difficulties in falling or staying asleep, show signs of being in constant fear, and they could also have frequent headaches and stomach aches. Now using myself as an example, I showed signs of being in fear frequently and I went through a phase where I had near constant stomach aches that would become more intense as it got closer to the weekend because I knew my mother and I would be around each other as we were both off of school and work. I got stomach aches so bad for a period of time that I would vomit at school and then they'd tell me that they were going to have to call her to come get me. I would literally cry and beg them not to. Rather, call my grandmother because I knew that was much safer. I remember literally being terrified of them calling her. Sometimes that worked, most often it didn't. And then I'd be in trouble, quote unquote, when she came to get me. As the children get to regular school age, they may begin to feel guilty and blame themselves for the violence in the home. It takes a huge chunk of a child's self-esteem and they may begin to shy away from participating in school activities. Their grades might be able to shift, which most sources say the grades will drop, but in my case, I kept my grades to nearly perfect because I was terrified of the consequences otherwise. These children might have fewer friends, and in my case, I've not really had many close friends at all or any real length of time, period. This age can also experience headaches, stomach aches, nightmares, trouble sleeping, and so on. Now with teens who witness or experience abuse, they may act out in negative ways, such as getting into fights with peers and family, skipping school. They may engage in risky behaviors, abuse drugs and alcohol, suffer from very low self-esteem, and have difficulty making new friends. They are prone to bullying others, are far more likely to get into trouble with the law, and so on. Now, the interesting aspect of this is that, statistically, teen boys abused in childhood are far more likely to get into trouble with the law than teen girls. On the other hand, teen girls are more likely to be withdrawn and experience depression, which was the case for me. As these children become adults, they are at a much higher risk of repeating the cycle by entering into abusive relationships or becoming abusers themselves. A boy who witnesses his mother being abused is 10 times more likely to abuse his partner as an adult. A girl who witnesses her father abuse her mother is also more than six times as likely to be sexually abused as a girl who grows up in a non-abusive home. 
If children are victims of emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, they're at a higher risk for health problems as adults as well, which can include mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, both of which I have in droves, but also may include diabetes, which I also have, obesity, heart disease, poor self-esteem, and a whole host of other problems. With serial killers and other violently dangerous criminals, there was a study conducted at the Federal University of Sao Paulo Department of Psychiatry in Brazil. It was a study review of biological, social, and environmental factors associated with aggressive behavior. The main environmental factors were child abuse, poverty, crime and antisocial behavior in childhood indicative of early parental neglect. What they determined was the key social predictors of violent and aggressive behavior did include poverty, family history of criminality, negative upbringing, failing at school, ADHD, and antisocial behavior during childhood. This is a big one. Children who are inconsistently punished or rewarded are at increased risk. Children who witness intense family conflict or whose parents are involved in crime are unable to develop the skills required for coping with social problems. Children born to negligent parents that engage in erratic discipline are in conflict with each other or commit crimes exhibit early criminal behaviors which in turn can be attributed to the continuation of this behavior during their lives. Forms of abuse at infancy such as maternal rejection, interparental violence, negligent parenting, repeat loss of the primary caregiver, severe or inconsistent discipline as well as sexual or physical abuse, all of these can contribute to the risk factors for developing violent behavior at infancy, which in turn is predictive of offensive, aggressive, and antisocial behavior in adults. It's really pretty simple. Children exposed to violence use violence to solve their own conflicts. This is a fact. So using myself as an example again, I was born into a bad situation with genetics that predisposed me to suffering with a handful of mental health issues. My childhood environment until I was in my mid-teens consisted of many sexual abuse instances, some very intense child abuse instances, over-the-top mental abuse as a means of having total control over me, a constant stream of male suitors in and out of the house with regards to my mother, threats of violence at me. The list is really quite long and that's not even really scratching the surface of my biological father. And yes, I have seen the nearly constant steady stream of requests for me to do a podcast on myself and I will when I'm comfortable doing it. I promise. Be patient with me. So, We've covered genetics and environment, so let's move into how the parents were raised as a contributing factor, which is an offshoot of environment. Our parents were clearly affected by their own parents and others with regards to what they inherited and how they were treated, as well as what they witnessed growing up. Attachment research has shown that one predictor of how our parents perform as parents is how they have been able to process and digest their own upbringing. Parents consciously and unconsciously look to their own childhood when it's time to take on the role of being a parent themselves. So by parents processing what happened to them, they are better able to relate to their own kids and provide the nurture that they need. They should be able to recognize that their, quote, instinctive reactions are not always representative of how they want to parent. They can also take the time to try to understand why their kids trigger them the way that they do. It is important to remember that all parents are just people and all people are inherently flawed. Taking the time to recognize the way their parents or other important caregivers affected them is part of growing up and becoming their own person. 
but there is no mistaking that their parents or our grandparents' parenting style shapes or distorts our parents' behavior, and then these behaviors get projected onto their own children. Some of the displayed behaviors are imitation. When pushed into a stressful situation, Parents are prone to pulling from what their own parents did to control negative behavior, such as shouting, spanking, and so on. Many parents justify hitting their children simply because that's how they were raised, often dismissing the countless proven studies showing corporal punishment has devastating effects. Now, I'm not going to sit and debate with anyone about how their parents beat them and they're happy they did. No. No, you aren't. I used to say that too. I was lying to myself and everyone else every single time I said that. It's not true. Parents sometimes overcompensate for their own parents' mistakes by projecting how they felt as a child onto their own children. And I kind of hope that that makes sense. Overcompensating by telling themselves that their children hurt in the same ways they hurt as children, which can have negative effects. Parents might typecast their own kids as the bad kid or the baby. But parents get triggered by their kids in the throes of confrontation. They feel stirred up or provoked by a current day situation that reminds them of their own past pain and they sort of get transported back into their own painful trauma. Recognizing these moments, stopping to give themselves a moment to think through before they react is crucial but some parents are just not capable. This is where they run the risk of treating their children just as negatively as they were treated by their own parents. So it's very crucial that parents take the time to evaluate their own childhood experiences, process, decide to improve upon the techniques they picked up on from their parents and simply do better. My personal biggest complaint about parents who don't seem to concern themselves with how they are emotionally or physically scarring their children clearly aren't willing to sacrifice for their children. Choosing your own selfish needs and satisfactions over the emotional and physical well-being of your child is inexcusable. If you are damaged, carrying around trauma from your own childhood and life experiences, Why in the hell would you then subject those same things to your own kids? Why? I've said this a million times and I'll say it again. Children start out innocent. If you don't sacrifice and do everything within your power and circumstances to give the healthiest, most loving environment with an appropriate level of discipline to your kids, well, then you are the problem then you're sending your spawn out into the world to further the cycle of negativity. Grow up. I said what I said. So for some examples, let's take a look at a couple of very famous serial killers. We'll start with Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer's mother's side was riddled with mental illness, alcoholism, and abusive tendencies. In fact, he had a great uncle that was an inmate at the Wisconsin State Hospital in 1920. So Joyce, Jeffrey's mother, right, her father was an alcoholic who was abusive toward his wife and the children. Her father was a sex addict with Joyce and her siblings knowing full well the sexual demands that he put on their mother. There were rumors that he sexually abused Joyce too, but I can't verify that. He hit her so hard one time that her head actually went through a glass window. To be fair, there were no real notable issues on Lionel's side of the family, Jeffrey's father, other than Lionel stating that he had some troubling thoughts as a teenager, but I believe them to be on the spectrum of what is really considered normal. Now, Joyce had a horrible pregnancy, apparently, with Jeffrey and was prescribed medications and given injections to help her cope with illness and her nerves. Jeffrey had a very small degree of maternal rejection as an infant, which could have potentially led to attachment issues for him. I think that they did personally, as lonely as he was. But that is speculation on my part completely. There was a lot of negativity and loud fighting between his parents, with Joyce going as far as to pick up a knife and making stabbing motions at Lionel. 
There was a lot of negativity and loud fighting between his parents with Joyce. She was in and out of the home suffering with mental health issues, feigned suicide attempts, and her symptoms seemed to mirror some of Ed Kemper's mother's behavior. Ed Kemper is actually a prime example of this entire discussion. His mother, Clarnell, was raised by a domineering and overbearing mother herself. Clarnell's father did nothing to intervene. Her brother displayed negative impulse control while in the army, spontaneously flying an airplane too low and accidentally striking a bus, though no one was injured. Clarnell was headstrong, highly intelligent, and active in school. But it seems she had no respect for her father. I would imagine she thought of him as weak. And this is something that she would kind of do to her future husband, Ed's father. She went on to marry Edmund's father and have three children. Ed was the middle between two sisters. Now, Ed witnessed regular heated parental fighting and Clarnell was said to have constantly belittled and humiliated him as a child and she physically abused him as well. She would lock him in a dirty, dingy, dark basement to sleep after convincing herself that Ed would do nefarious things to his sister, though he never displayed behaviors toward his sisters that would indicate he would ever do anything to them that was truly terrible. She also told her son that no girls would ever be attracted to him and other really horrible things. His mother was described as a, quote, violent alcoholic and had many men in and out of her life as Edmund was growing up. That sounds familiar. In his teens, he was forced to live with his paternal grandparents, and his grandmother was just as domineering to him as his mother, or at least he felt that way, and we all know how that ended. It has been heavily speculated that she suffered with borderline personality disorder, characterized by antisocial behavior, compulsive behavior, hostility, impulsivity, irritability, risk-taking behaviors, self-destructive behaviors, self-harm, social isolation, lack of restraint, anger, anxiety, general discontentment, guilt, loneliness, mood swings, depression, grandiosity, narcissism, and on and on. And this is also what I strongly believe my own mother has, though there has been no official diagnosis. Borderline personality disorder has four subtypes according to Bridges to Recovery. Discouraged, impulsive, petulant, and self-destructive. Discouraged exhibit behaviors like neediness and dependency, secretly harboring a lot of anger toward others and easily disillusioned. They have a strong desire for acceptance and approval, but also are riddled with feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. Impulse symptoms can include energetic, charismatic, and exciting to be around. They are easily bored, quick to become angered when they perceive others letting them down, and are often involved in conflicts. They want to be noticed, but have strong antisocial instincts. Petulant borderlines are unpredictable and difficult to please. They are irritable and prone to outbursts of anger and frustration. They are often quite impatient with others and are quick to become disillusioned when they don't get exactly what they want. Self-destructive types are their own worst enemies and are prone to all manner of dangerous behavior. They often sabotage themselves when it appears they are making positive progress in their own lives. Now with Ed, we have the perfect storm. Inherited mental illness and him developing antisocial personality disorder. Of course, in his youth, they called him schizophrenic. I don't think that he was. And having repressed anger at his mother, a severely negative environment, and so on, which for Ed created the perfect storm for him to become a serial killer, though many people seem to have this exact recipe and never go on to hurt anyone. And there are tons of other dangerous criminals that we could list here, but you get the picture.
Aside from a serious mental health issue, such as the schizophrenia that Richard Chase suffered with, or a rather intense head injury like Alexander Pachushkin experienced as a child, most of them need more than just one factor in order to become a violent offender. This is why we come here, why we are driven to better understand these people. We are not serial killer sympathizers, which I've been called in my comments, who have no empathy for the victims. That is simply untrue. I think I safely speak for the entire murder family that we are horrified by the actions of these people. Who would want to be tortured and murdered? Certainly not me. And to have a loved one suffer at the hands of these people dealing with the things that these victims dealt with before they died? Incomprehensible. What we are trying to do in our community is find an understanding of how these people are created, how they are molded, shaped into what they become, how they think and what drives their compulsions so that we can possibly recognize it in others and maybe just maybe we can stop them before they ever strike. So that's a little bit of science behind the crimes. I hope you enjoyed it. You can leave me a comment below if you're watching or you can DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can always email me at serial killing Instagram at gmail.com. Consider becoming a patron if you'd like. And as always, Thank you so much for listening because I know you could be watching or listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I appreciate that. Thank you so much and have a great day.